In this video, we will discuss vectors and vector fields on a manifold M. First, we will define vectors as objects that are tangent to the curves and prove that they form a vector space. Those vectors will be defined at a specific point of the manifold P and they will define the tangent space at the specific point P. If this is done for every point of the manifold M in a smooth way, this will give us a vector field, which we will discuss later. Vectors in a manifold cannot be thought as straight arrows, as we do in a, a three-dimensional space or in Minkowski space. We have to use concepts that are intrinsic to the manifold to construct them, and especially there should be no reference to embeddings of the manifolds to a, into a higher dimensional space. This we usually do that. Do, this we usually do when we do um, the differential geometry of uh, two-dimensional surfaces in uh, three-dimensional space, and in that case, we think of uh, vectors on the surface as being tangent to the surfaces in this embedding. But, in our case, we don't want to have an embedding of the manifold since it has uh, no meaning in uh, several contexts like that of uh, the general theory of productivity. Vectors will be defined as objects that are tangent to curves, and we will show that they form a vector space. It is important to understand uh, their definition because they will be the fundamental objects on which we will define higher rank uh, tensors. After we have defined vectors, we will define one forms as being linear functions on the tangent space. And after we have defined vectors and one forms, we will be able to define tensors of any rank as linear maps from uh, on vectors and one forms. If we consider a vector at the point P as uh, a tangent uh, to curves, we immediately realize that there is an infinite number of curves that have the same tangent vector at that point. So, in a sense, the vector is a representative of this, of this uh, class of curves, which is also an equivalence class if we consider uh, two such curves being equivalent if they have the same tangent vector at the point P. We want V to be a measure of the rate of change of things while moving on such a curve. Having said that, we also understand that the definition of the vector will depend on the parameterization of that curve. If we change the parameter on a set of points that belong, let's say, to the curve gamma 1, then we will visit <coughs> those points at a different rate with respect to the new parameter than with the old one. Things of interest for us, which are also intrinsic on the manifold, are the real functions on M. So, let's say that we have such a function that maps all the points on M onto the real numbers R. Then, consider a curve, which is a map from the real numbers, taking the parameter to the curve, onto points on the manifold M this being such a curve shown in the cartoon here. But this map F, together with uh, the curve gamma, defines a real function. And it is a real function uh, on, uh, that can be considered a real function on the points of the curve gamma. If we compose gamma with F, then gamma will take us to a point, and then f will take us to a real number. So we have a map from the parameter t to the value of f 
at gamma of t. So this gives us an ordinary real function. And there we know very well how to measure the rate of change of that function by computing derivatives. So if we have a curve that at t equals 0 goes to the point p, then the derivative of that function at t equals 0 will give us how fast this function is changing in the neighborhood of that point. If we repeat this process for any function f, then this directional derivative of those functions at the point p gives us a measure of how fast things change at p. So we identify the process of taking this directional derivative with the vector v. So we define the v to be an operator, the directional derivative operator, which when acts, when it acts on any function f, it gives us the directional derivative of f at the point p. This operation can be thought of as acting linearly on functions. If we have two such fu functions on m, f and g, and two real numbers, alpha and beta, then when v acts on the linear combination of those functions, the result is the linear combination of the actions on the separate functions. And this should be obvious by the known uh, property of uh, the derivative operator. There is also a rule about how uh, the vector v acts on, the, on an ordinary product of two functions. And this is obtained by first v acting on f multiplied by g plus f multiplying the action of v on the function g. This is a Leibniz rule, and it derives from the corresponding property of the derivative of the product of two functions. Such an operation that obeys those two rules is called the derivation. And the set of functions at the point P, the, sorry, the set of vectors at the point P are identified with all possible derivations. Now we want to show that all such vectors form a vector space. And this vector space depends on the choice, of course, of the point P. We call this space the tangent space of M because it contains all the vectors that are tangent to curves passing through P. In a vector space, we want to be able to do all sorts of linear algebra. So we have to be able to take linear combinations of vectors and obtain vectors. So we have to show that if we have any two such vectors in this space, then any linear combination of them is also a vector belonging to the same space. To convince ourselves, we have to show that actually this linear combination is also a derivation. That means that if we take any two smooth functions on M, then those two properties will be satisfied. When the linear combination acts on the linear combination of functions, the result will be this one. And when it acts on the product of function, then we will have the Leibniz rule. So let's convince ourselves that the first property actually holds. So we want to compute the action of W on the linear combination of those two functions. We substitute for W and distribute this linear combination on acting on the linear combination of functions we obtain 
this equation here. And then we use the fact that v and u are vectors, therefore they act linearly on their arguments. So we obtain this. We rearrange terms and take c1 and c2 as common factors, and then we see that in the brackets we have the linear combination v and u that gives us the vector w. So indeed, the vector w satisfies the first property of the derivations. Now, let's see what happens when w acts on a product of two functions. So, after we make this distribution here, we use the fact that v and u, as being vectors, they uh, satisfy the Leibniz rule for their argument. So we apply the Leibniz rule here and here. We rearrange terms, and then we see that the common factors of the terms with g and f are the linear combinations that gives us the vector w. So, indeed, w satisfies the Leibniz rule. So, w is a derivation, but we have no geometric intuition of why w, w is actually a vector. So, let's look at it in more detail. Let's start from the vector alpha v, where alpha is a real number, which will give us a vector that intuitively corresponds to a vector that is parallel to v and scaled by a factor of alpha. So, if the vector v is given by the curve gamma v or t, so, so that v is the uh, operator d by dt at the point p, then uh, consider a new curve, gamma prime. The curve gamma prime has as image the same points that the curve gamma v has, but uh, it visits th those points at the value of its parameter t prime when gamma v has a value of t which is equal to alpha t prime. Therefore, the vector of that curve at the point P is the derivative of this function when it acts on F. And by the definition of gamma prime, this is actually equal to the derivative of this function here. But we know how to take the derivative of this function. We just have this a factor alpha coming out, and here we have uh, the derivative of the function that is the action of v on f. The fact that the sum of two vectors is a vector needs a little bit more work to see. First, let's note that when alpha v and beta u, a linear combination of the two vectors v and u, acts on a function f, it gives us the linear combination of the directional derivatives d by dt at the point p and d by d lambda at the point p. So we have those two curves, this is gamma v, the der directional derivative here gives us the vector v, and we have the curve gamma u, with parameter lambda, whose uh, directional derivative at the point P gives us the vector u. So, the question is, is there a curve that has as a tangent vector at the point P this linear combination? These are two numbers that they know nothing about uh, the neighborhood of that uh, curve. So, we actually have to check whether this is true. We will find that the answer, of course, is yes. But let's see why, because that will give us some intuition. 
Before doing this, let me derive a relation that will be quite useful. So, we will consider the action of a vector at the point P on any function f, given by the directional derivative df by dt at the point P. So, let's remember the context of computing this derivative. We have a curve gamma here, which gives us uh, a map of the, para of the of, uh, real numbers onto the manifold M. And then we have the function f that takes those points onto the real line. So this derivative here is computed, as we have already said, by considering the composition of gamma with f that takes us from real numbers to real numbers. And here we actually compute the derivative of a real function. But the computation of this derivative can be done uh, using, let's say, a longer take, by taking a longer route than directly uh, from R to P and from P to R. So let's consider a coordinate system in the neighborhood of P, such that uh, na this neighborhood of P is mapped into the uh, into R n, giving coordinates x mu to those points. So the function gamma composed with f can be cons can be thought of as the composition of those two maps. First one, this one, and second, that one. So you see, to go from here to here, I just is inserted here the identity map, which gives us an equality. But what does it actually mean? First, we compose gamma with uh, the map of the chart, the coordinate system. So we go from t to the point p, and then chi gives us the coordinates of the point p. So this here, for any value of t, will give us the coordinates of uh, the points on the curve. So it is kind of an image of the curve in the coordinate system. Now, the other function here starts from a point uh, in Rn, uses the inverse map of the chart to give us a point on the manifold, and then we, we obtain a real number by using the function f. So this is actually a function on Rn. So here the notation can be a little bit confusing, so let me clarify it a little bit. So when I write here x mu of t, this is actually all the n numbers that gives us the coordinates of the point P. And when I write here f of x nu, I don't mean a function of just the coordinate x nu, but a function of all the coordinates x0 through xn minus 1. I hope this is not too confusing, but it is customary in many textbooks in differential geometry and uh, relativity. So, the derivative here can be computed as the derivative of this function as a function of t, where here we have the coordinates of a point on the curve. And we can use the chain rule for the composition of maps and obtain this result here that involves products of factors that have the partial derivative of this function as a function of the coordinates times the rate of change of the coordinates on the image of the curve gamma. Now, here, a little bit of notation. This is not one product. This is sum of many products. And the convention is here the Einstein summation convention. And uh, when we write an expression where we have an upstair index being the same as a downstairs index, then this is actually a sum of this term 
for all allowed values of the repeated index. So, with this understanding, we simplify the writing of many formulas. So, introducing some more notation here, this result here can be written this way, and when I write d mu f, I actually mean the partial derivative of f as a function of the coordinates with respect to the coordinates. So we can use this formula now for any vector. Let's consider now two curves, gamma v and gamma u, which intersect at the point p, and the corresponding tangent vectors of them, on, of them are vp and up respectively. We also assume that the parameters here are such that uh, gamma p of 0 and gamma u of 0 is the same point, the common point p. Then, the action of their tangent vectors on any function on m is given by the respective directional derivatives, which we have shown that they can be written in this way here. Now, if we take a coordinate system in the vicinity of P, then when we consider uh, the map that takes a point P to the value of one of its coordinates, x mu, so here for the moment we don't uh, mean here the collection of all coordinates, but the specific coordinate x mu, then this is a real function on m, and assigns to any point in the coordinate system to the value of its coordinate x mu. Since this is one of the possible functions that a vector can act on, then if let's say the vector v acts on this function, the result will be the right-hand side of this equation, where f is substituted by x mu. But the derivative of x mu with respect to x nu is just the Kronecker delta. It is 1 when nu is equal to nu and 0 otherwise. So, when we make this summation here, the index nu here is repeated and summed over, then the only term that will be selected by the Kronecker delta is this one, and we will have dx mu by dt. Therefore, when the vp acts on x mu, that gives us the rate of change of the coordinate x mu on the image of the curve gamma v. And the same is true for the vector u. When u acts on x mu, it gives us the rate of change of the coordinate mu on the curve gamma u. As we have already said, using the chart, we can map part of the curve in a specific coordinate system. So, if x mu of t is the image of this curve gamma v, then we obtain a curve in Rn, and when the image of the curve gamma u, when we compute the image of the curve gamma u, we obtain this curve in Rn, which we will denote x mu of lambda. So, by putting here the parameter, we differentiate between the two curves gamma v and gamma u. So there are actually two different curves in Rn. So those two curves cross at the point P. Therefore, their images cross at the image of the point P in this coordinate system. So if we take, let's say, the curve gamma v and uh, consider a point at the parameter distance epsilon from the point p, 
which is at t equals zero, then this value will be given by this Taylor series expansion. And terms up to order epsilon involve the value of x mu at t equals zero plus epsilon times the first derivative at zero. So this can be anything, but it vanishes as epsilon goes to zero as epsilon square. We can do the same thing here on the curve gamma u. Sorry, on the image of the curve gamma u. And obtain this point here by doing a similar Taylor expansion. Now, define a curve gamma w with parameter epsilon so that its image in Rn is given by x mu of epsilon. And you define this curve by defining it, by defining it in Rn. So we define the image of that curve for every epsilon, not just the infinitesimal epsilon, to be x mu of 0 plus epsilon times the linear combination of those two directional derivatives at t equals 0. So these are, this is a number here. It's not a function of epsilon. Okay, the functional dependence on epsilon is just the linear dependence coming out of here. Then we add anything we like that is of order epsilon square. That means that whatever we add here, as epsilon goes to 0, this term has to remain finite. So this will give us an infinite set of curves, but it, they will all behave the same way as epsilon goes to zero. So let's compute the tangent vector of that curve. So the tangent vector of that curve acting on any function of f will give us the directional derivative of f with respect to epsilon at, t, at epsilon equal to zero. So, as we did before for the curves gamma u and for the curves gamma u and gamma v, gamma v, we consider this computation by uh, computing this function, which in a simplified way can be thought of as the function of f being composed with x nu as a function of epsilon. And this be written as this sum of products of the partial derivatives of f with respect to x mu times the rate of change of the coordinates of the points on the curve along the curve with respect to epsilon at the point p. But we have defined that curve to be such that the derivative at the point zero is precisely this linear combination. This was done by construction. So we can substitute this here. And then it is easy to see that this is nothing but the linear combination of the action of v on f and u on f. And because this holds for any function on m, that means that the linear combination of v and u is a vector equal to w. So now let's consider a special class of curves that derives from the choice of a coordinate system. So let's consider a point on the manifold and a coordinate system with a chart here that is mapped in, into Rn via the map chi. And let's define those curves by considering the chart here and uh, choose one of the coordinates, let's say x mu, and move along a direction parallel to the axis of x mu. So 
That means that as we move along these points, we obtain a curve here that corresponds to points where all the coordinates except x mu are held constant and we only vary the chosen coordinate x mu. So this is a one parameter map from this neighborhood here onto that neighborhood. Therefore, it is a map from the real numbers onto the manifold. And that gives us a curve. So, this is a curve where actually the coordinate x mu is the parameter of the curve. So, this curve has a tangent vector at p, as all curves going through p have. We will denote this tangent vector as d mu, where we use the symbol of the partial derivative in this notation. So, if this is the curve here, then the tangent vector here is d mu. So, when this vector acts on any real function on M, then this action is computed by the directional derivative along that curve at the point P. So, following the same steps as we do for any curve, we compute this directional derivative by considering this function here as a function of the parameter of the curve. But, as you can see here, the derivative of that function is nothing but the partial derivative of that function here. Because of the definition of the curve here, when we vary x mu, then this function here is varied along only one of its arguments. So that is what we call partial derivative. So, we denote this directional derivative operator here by this dm which, whose action on a function f gives us the partial derivative of that function at the point p. We have already shown that when a vector v at the point p acts on any function f, the result is given by the sum of the products of the partial derivatives with the rate of change of the coordinates of the points of the curve with respect to the parameter. And we have written this in this abbreviated form. Therefore, we can consider the right-hand side of this equation as an operator that acts on functions f. Notice that this operator here is what we called the coordinate basis vector d mu. So, this sum of products is a linear combination of all the possible such uh, coordinate basis vectors d mu. But we know from linear algebra that such a linear combination gives us the components of a vector with respect to the chosen basis. So, any vector v can be written in such a linear combination with this specific value of its components. Therefore, the coordinate basis vectors is actually a basis on the tangent space, and since it consists of n vectors, this space is n-dimensional, the same dimensionality of the manifold M. Because 
those vectors are derived from the chosen coordinate system, we call this set a coordinate basis. But we have to note that not all bases in the tangent space of M are coordinate bases. We know from linear algebra that if we have any bases in a linear space, then any linear combination here, where those coefficients here form a non-degenerate matrix, will give us a new basis in the tangent space. Furthermore, if there is additional structure in the tangent space, which we don't have yet, but we will have later, is that there may be an inner product in the uh, tangent space. For example, the one that derives from a chosen metric on the manifold. Then, the coordinate basis may consist of vectors that are not orthogonal to each other, and they might also not be unit vectors. Of course they may, but in most of the cases they will not be. Many times it is useful to consider orthonormal bases on uh, such manifolds, and in that case such bases may not derive from a coordinate system. So, we want to see now what happens to the components of a vector as we change a coordinate system. Of course, when we change a coordinate system, nothing happens to vectors. They stay the same. But, as we change the coordinates, the coordinate basis changes, therefore the uh, components of the vectors will change. To compute this change, let us uh, mention that if we have a coordinate, coordinate basis with respect to two different coordinate systems, then the one will be a linear combination of the other. And <coughs> the uh, coefficients here in the linear combinations will be the derivatives of the coordinates in one system with respect to the other. It is easy to see that by applying the chain rule for partial derivatives. So, if we take the same vector v and express it as a linear combination with respect to the choice of these two different bases, we will have different components v mu and v mu prime. Now, if we substitute d mu prime as a linear combination of d mu, then we obtain an expression that has <coughs> a factor here that can be identified with the components of the vector v with respect to the basis d mu. And if we equate these fa those factors, we see how the components from one uh, basis transform to the components of the other basis. So, uh, just notice how easy it is to memorize this rule, because all we have to do is to match indices in both sides of those equations. So you see, three indices on the right-hand side are matched with three indices on the left-hand side, and then indices upstairs are summed with indices downstairs. Now, if we want to express the coordinates v, v mu prime as functions of v mu, we have to invert this relation. So this is a linear system, and in order to invert it, we have to compute the inverse of this matrix here. But we know from analysis that the inverse of this matrix is given by the matrix of the derivatives of x mu prime with respect to x mu. Therefore, the, we obtain that the coordinates v mu, v mu prime are related to the coordinates v mu by a similar relation here, and all we have to do is to match the indices uh, 
between the three indices between the left hand side and right hand side and sum over the other ones on the right hand side. Now, if we have another basis, possibly a non-coordinate basis, that is related to the coordinate basis by this relation here, then the components of the vector with respect to this non-coordinate basis is related to the components of the vector to the coordinate basis by a similar relation. Simply substitute Ea here by its equal and take the common factors here to be equal. This is true because these are linearly independent. So V mu is connected to VA through this relation. As a simple example, consider Lorentz transformation, which is uh, something that we do in the special theory of relativity. So, in the special theory of relativity, if we have two inertial observers given by coordinates x mu prime and x mu, then the two coordinates are related to each other with a Lorentz transformation represented by this matrix here, where this matrix here is, uh, consists of elements that do not depend on x. Therefore, the derivative of x mu prime with respect to x mu are simply those constant coefficients here, lambda mu prime mu, and the components of the two vectors uh, are related in the well-known way under a Lorentz transformation. So let's move on now to vector fields. Since the construction of vectors at the point P uh, was independent of the choice of the point P, we can repeat this for any point of the manifold. Therefore, above each point of the manifold, we obtain a tangent space hanging above it. This in mathematics gives us a structure called the fiber bundle. Now, if we pick up a vector from each such tangent space in a smooth way, then we have a vector field. That means that the vector field can be thought of as a map from the points uh, giving us a vector at each point of the manifold M. We know how such vectors act on any smooth function on M. Therefore, at every point of the manifold M, we obtain a number which is the directional derivative of F with respect to the parameter that defines uh, the vector V at that point. But then, this number here, defined at every point P, gives us a function on the manifold M. If this function is smooth for every choice of smooth function, then we call the vector field smooth. And it is easy to, to see that uh, if we pick up a coordinate system, then the corresponding coordinate basis vectors at all points of the chart are uh, consist of smooth vector fields. A vector V can be expressed as a linear combination of those vectors at every point, and those coefficients here are the components of that vector at any given point of the chart. So these components here become a function from the points of the chart onto the real numbers. Furthermore, if we consider the action of V on the functions x mu, this gives us the coordinates of, uh, sorry, the components of the vector V 
at uh, the corresponding point. So that implies that if we have a smooth vector field, then its components must also be smooth in a coordinate basis. With every vector field, there is a class of curves on the manifold that are associated with it. It's integral curves. The integral curves generalize to what we already know, let's say, from electrostatics, being, for example, the dynamic field lines of the electric field. So these are lines where the electric field is tangent to at each point. So let's first consider a point P that belongs to a chart that gives to all points in that chart's coordinates x mu. If you consider that and take any point in that chart, then uh, the components of that vector are just the directional derivatives of the functions x mu on, uh, on the curve that defines v mu. And that is true for, uh, for all points on that curve. Now, t is the parameter of the curve for which v is tangent, is tangent to at all of its points. If p has coordinates that are known at, let's say, t equals 0, then the set of differential equations given by 1 has a unique solution, x mu of t. So that, that will give us a curve in the chart which will translate to a curve on the manifold. That is the unique integral curve of V going through the point P. Notice that the inter integral curves of a vector field uh, on some subset, open subset of M, uh, fill densely that set U. The reason is that for each point of that set, there is one and only one curve going through it. So, integral curves pass through every point of the set U. Furthermore, they never cross, because there is a unique integral going, going through every point of the set U. This family of curves is called the congruence. Now let's see what is the Lie bracket of two vector fields. So if we have two such vector fields, V and W on M, then for every smooth function F, we have the directional derivatives along the integral lines of V and W, which are now smooth functions on the manifold M. So, since V and W act on any functions, on any function on M, they can also act on those particular functions. So we can define what is the action of W on V of F. So W simply acts to the directional derivative of F with respect to T as a function on M. That will be given by the directional derivative of that function with respect to lambda, but we have to be careful here because this is not an ordinary second derivative. So in order to compute this object here, we have to follow the following three steps. First, we compute the directional derivative df dt along the integral curves of v. Then we consider this as a function on m. And as a function on m, we compute the directional derivative of that function with respect to lambda along the integral curves of w. So it's kind of a complicated object. For simplicity, we write this object here as 
a product of V and W with the understanding that this means the action of V of W and V on this function, the one after the other, in this order. Note that this operator here is an operator on functions, but it is not a vector field. We define the Lie bracket of two vector fields V and W by considering the commutator of V and W as operators on functions. That means that when V, the commutator of V and W acts on a function f, this is actually meant by the difference of W first acting on f and then act on this result by V and subtracting what we obtain by doing the same procedure in the reverse order. It turns out that this is actually a vector field, and that's why we give it a special name and we call it the Lie bracket of V and W. To show that it is a vector field, we have to show that it is a derivation. That means that if we take any two smooth functions on M and real numbers alpha and beta, those two properties must be satisfied by the Lie bracket. So, well, the first one is very easy to prove and we leave it as an exercise. Let's look at the second one. Let's prove that this is actually true. So, we start with the first term of the left-hand side, which is W acting on the product F times G, and then take this result and act on it by the vector V. So, it is actually what is written here on the right-hand side. Now, W is a vector field, and we can apply the Leibniz rule on the product. And V is a derivation, so this is a linear combination of those two terms, and we can write them as the linear combination of the action of V and them. But then, V is a derivation, so we apply the Leibniz rule separately on each of these terms. So this is the product of two functions, and the Leibniz rule will give us those two terms, and this is the product of those two functions, and the Leibniz rule will give us those two terms. From the result, we note that V times W is not a derivation. So we have terms that uh, make the Leibniz rule not to hold for this operator, those two terms here. Now we go through the same steps in the opposite direction, first by applying V on the product and then W on the result. And as you can see, we obtain this equation here, which is the same one as this one, by exchanging the roles of V and W. By subtracting those two equations, you see that those terms here cancel. The green one with the green one, and the red one with the red one. And what we are left with is this and this, which we factor out here, and this and this, which we group them here. So, if you look at this equation, this tells us that when uh, the commutator of V and W acts on the product of F and G, this will uh, uh, give us uh, uh, the same result as if we apply the Leibniz rule on the product, which is what we wanted to prove in the first place. The components of the Lie bracket of two vectors is given by this relation only in a coordinate basis. We will use this relation a lot, so uh, it's nice to have an, a mnemonic rule and it is easy to construct one. So this is a commutator 
So first write V and W in the opposite way, like we do in a commutator. Put in between the sign of the partial derivative and the index of the component goes to the component that is differentiated. Now the rest of the indices are summed over. So let's note that when v acts on x mu as a function, we obtain the component v mu of the vector field v, and when w acts on x mu as a function, we obtain the component w mu. And the action of v on any function f is given by the action of this operator on f. And similarly for w. So, if we compute Vw acting on x mu, then this is computed by uh, the sequential action first of W on x mu and then V on the result. But W acting on x mu gives us the component W mu of the vector field W. And since this is a function, V acts on it the way it acts on any function f. Similarly, if we do things the opposite order, in the opposite order, then we obtain the result shown here. If we subtract those equations, then the left-hand side gives us the mu component of the Lie bracket, and the right-hand side gives us the result that we quoted here. The Lie bracket of two vector fields defines a derivative, which we call the Lie derivative. For the purpose of those lectures, let's call it the practical way, the Lie derivative of a vector field W with respect to the vector field V is given by the Lie bracket of V and W. We also define the Lie derivative of a function f along the field V to be given by the action of V on f, which is nothing but the directional derivative of f in the direction of V. Notice that the Lie derivative of an object gives us back an object of the same kind. So the Lie derivative of a vector field is a vector field, and the Lie derivative of a function is a function. That this is a derivative can be seen from the fact that it first satisfies this uh, linear property rule when, when we take the lead derivative of a linear combination, this is the linear combination of the derivatives. And we have a Leibniz rule where when we consider the vector field taken by multiplying uh, w by any smooth function f, then this is taken by two terms. This is taken by considering first the action of the derivative on the function f times the vector field w, plus f times the action of the lead derivative on the vector field w. Indeed, the lead derivative acts linearly on vector fields, and it can be easily seen by taking the definition. So this is the Lie bracket of v and the linear combination, and uh, we know that uh, the Lie bracket, being a commutator of operators, is linear in its second argument. Therefore, the Lie derivative is also linear. If we consider now the vector field multiplied by a function f, then its Lie derivative with respect to v is given by this Lie bracket. But 
In order to compute the right hand side, let's consider its action on any smooth function G of the manifold M. So when this Lie bracket acts on G, then first we have V acting on F times W of G, then FW acting on V on G. Now, this is the product of two functions, so we can apply the Leibniz rule for the vector field V, and the second term is left as is. So if we regroup the terms in this way, we see that the first term here is simply the function V acting on F times the vector field W plus F times the commutator of V with W. But this is the definition of the lead derivative of the function F and this is the, de the definition of the lead derivative of the vector field W with respect to V. Another exercise that will convince us that the lead derivative is a vector field is to prove that its components transform as they do for any other vector field. So let's consider two coordinate systems, x mu and x mu prime, and then the components of vectors in uh, those two uh, coordinate bases will be related by the, those transformations that we uh, derived before. Furthermore, the two coordinate bases are connected via uh, a linear relation, which, as we have already mentioned, comes from the chain rule of partial derivatives. Then, if we consider the expression v d nu w in the prime coordinate system, and we substitute each of the of the terms here by the ones that give us the components in the new coordinate system, we obtain this equation here. So for v nu prime, we substituted its equal, then the partial derivative d nu prime is substituted by this expression here. So this is an, an operator acting on this function here, which is nothing but w mu, w mu prime in, uh, in terms of the components w mu. Now, let's regroup the, those terms and put those two uh, terms involving the partial derivatives together. And we note that this is the multiplication of two matrices that are inverse to each other, as we have already mentioned. So this is the new sigma element of the unit matrix, which is nothing but the Kronecker delta at positions of the matrix nu and sigma. So when we compute the sum of all those terms, the only non-vanishing terms will be ones where this index here, sigma, will be equal to nu. Otherwise, we will have a zero. And the result will be this one here. But now, the derivative d nu acts on the product of those two functions. So we apply the product rule, and we have those two terms arising here. So the first term here has, involves second derivatives of x mu prime with respect to x mu, and the other term here has only first derivatives. 
So notice that this combination here does not transform like the components of a vector because this indeed corresponds to the transformation rule of the components of the vector but we have this additional term here. But if we do the same work for w dv then we will obtain the same result by exchanging the roles of v and w and it will be this one. To go to the components of the Lie bracket we have to subtract those two equations and we see that the terms involving the second derivatives vanish and all we are left with are with terms that have as a common factor the derivatives of x mu prime with respect to x mu. But inside the parentheses here these are the components of the Lie bracket in the x mu coordinate system. Therefore, the components of the Lie bracket Vw at the mu prime coordinate system are related to the components of Vw in the mu coordinate system with the transformation rule that we use for the components of any vector. So, this is just scratching the surface of what the Lie, deriv Lie derivatives actually are. So, there is a video which is uh, uh, devoted to uh, going deeper into the concept of a Lie derivative and discusses geometric interpretation to see why this is actually a, a derivative and uh, how we can compare vectors at two different points in order to compute the derivative and see how it acts on any tensor field besides functions and uh, vector fields. And also it presents some of its properties that are useful in calculations.